Hello, welcome to the 50-minute hour. My name is Corey, and today I'm joined by Garrison, uh, Calvin, and Seraphim. What's up? What are we all drinking today? I am drinking a watermelon cucumber margarita style hard seltzer and it's interesting i'm drinking the black coffee i've got plain ice water and i'm also just having coffee it's a pretty sober day we had to recover from the milkshakes the milkshakes (laughs) so what is today's topic well so last last podcast we were supposed to have a a guest um my new zealander friend a protestant who's a scholar on uh second temple judaism and universalism and we were supposed to have a muslim scholar uh on a variety of topics but including universalism within the muslim tradition today but he was not able to make it so i thought i'd take an opportunity you know open discussion but just kind of orient our listeners who might not be familiar with uh, universalism or exactly what that is. Um, and it is something that seems to be very misunderstood nowadays, but all simultaneously very popular, um, particularly because of David Bentley Hart's recent publication of all on universalism that all shall be saved. So just kind of talking about that and seeing where that goes. Um, I guess I'll start saying like, I've, been into this topic since I've been into Christianity. Um, is this? There's so many places you can really take this to. Um, I guess for me, it, it was like the the impetus of what since one has reading scripture seems to be so varied from one person to another, very subjective, which is one reason I don't put much stock in something like Sola Scriptura. But it seemed to me that one reading scripture at first glance has a very clear idea of damnation and eternal damnation, especially reading uh, Jesus' preaching about it. But then you start looking at the Greek and you start looking at what Paul was saying and you start comparing that to the things that Jesus are saying in context. And then I start getting a very different idea. But then I'll talk to other people who have a very different idea, just going off of scripture. And one thing I start to notice in I guess was this idea, especially in the West, where this seemed to have become particularly prominent sometime after the 5th or 6th century. And then the further I looked into it, especially with scholars like um, Ramelli, um, was that it actually seems, and even some of the church fathers who were antagonistic to universalism would agree with this, that the majority of early Christians actually uh, were universalist, or what we would now call universalist. So what do we mean by universal? I guess we should say that first. Um, it's basically just an idea that whatever hell is, Most universalists would say hell exists, or death, or Hades, or Gehenna, whatever you want to call it. Um, Its created purpose is purgation. It's not a torture chamber. Um, They would also probably add that, and so far that's the case, God's will will be accomplished with the creation of hell. So that is to say the people who end up in hell, they might even be Macedonata, right? They might say most people are damned. But by damned, they mean most people have to go through the flame of Hades uh, in order to be purified to enter heaven. So to a lot of years in the West, this probably sounds like purgatory. And I will say, I think it's very interesting that we don't have that division in the East because there never was a need for one. Why? Because hell or Hades or Gehenna always already served that function. Even church fathers who don't hold to universalism have this view of hell. Basically, the idea being that whether you're eternally damned or not isn't really determined once you die and go to hell. That's something determined later on at the last judgment. Um, so hell's purpose even here with a non-universalist church father is not per se um, purely punitive. Um, if you look at Plato's Gorgias, he has this idea of uh, what the purpose of punishment is. It's a philosophy of justice, a philosophy of punishment, um, which is that it's always in some way retributive. And you can definitely make a case that the whole prison complex today only functions because of the Calvinist Protestant idea of the philosophy of what hell is supposed to be under God's creation. Uh, which is to say it's not rehabilitative, but it's purely punitive, uh, retributive. So it's much more of a holding tank until the final judgment. Yeah, and I think it's ironic too, especially with the Protestant 
and because Protestants tend to have this idea that if something's pagan, it's automatically wrong, and Christianity totally revolutionizes everything that came before. I think what's ironic is that the, the universalist reading is actually the part of Christianity that would be very novel or very unique. The pagan system of justice, both in this life and the afterlife, very much works on the idea of retrib retributive justice. If you take this idea of hell as being retrib retributive, which most conservative Protestants do, you actually just end up with Christianity being a pure continuation of the pagan idea here, the pagan philosophy. If Christianity was actually revolutionary here, which I do, I think, I don't think Christianity is very re revolutionary with, with a lot of pagan beliefs, but I think it is here. It's precisely in this idea that the purpose of punishment is to um, rehabilitate, to make one ready for coming into the, the flame of God, right? So in the Orthodox tradition also, we have this idea that the fires of hell are the same fires of God's love. This comes especially as St. Uh, Isaac the Syrian, who is a universalist saint in the Orthodox Church, but I'll get into him more later. Um, sorry, was there another question there? Well, I think um, Calvin kind of brought up something interesting when he said the holding tank, and um, you were using the words like hell, Hades, you know, Gehenna, all kind of the same, but I, I think that usually how people understand it um, is that Hades is sort of um, the place where the dead go, like that holding tank. But Gehenna had more of that interpretation of the final, you know, damnation. And it does bring an interesting point with universalism. I, I want to see how this is answered. Like, there is that sense, uh, we get it mostly from the, like, the parable of um, the rich men and Lazarus, right? That there's some sort of holding area, one that's, you know, nice and lovely and one that's, you know, in suffering that's sort of the holding area until the final judgment. Um, and then at the final judgment, that is again, the final judgment and it, it determined, you know, the, the, you know, sheep and the goats, you know, uh, how does that fit in with like universalism, that idea of, of a, the kind of holding space until the final judgment and then a final judgment and a final place that one goes to. Yeah, this is a good question. I want to address several things first. Um, let's talk about these these terms because we throw around like these four or five terms. Hell, which isn't biblical. Um, it's a Scandinavian word right. um, that was referring to their idea of the afterlife. What, this other concept that's good to understand with a lot of the pagan religions, they don't really have much of a reward unless you're like a god hero or something. They don't really have this heaven paradise. It, death is always pretty much terrible whether you're a good or evil person or whatever they don't really even have these moral systems that we think of dualistically like we do nowadays after christianity's influence um and then we have gehenna which was this uh, jewish idea of uh where most souls went after death again doesn't matter if you're moses or whoever right everyone kind of goes into abraham's bosom um which wasn't pleasant um there is this there are now they're all competing traditions in Judaism here. There was competing traditions on to what degree of the unpleasantness was happening, like if you're Moses versus like a thief or something, um, to what degree there is soul sleep or not, which still Protestants today debate over, um, which is just basically being an unconscious in um, Abraham's bosom or in Gehenna. Um, Gehenna was was a place, a literal area where all the trash burned, right? And, and there was worms and stuff. And hence the, the phrase, the worm dieth not. Um, but uh, there, it seems that the idea of uh, the eternality of Gehenna was something introduced around um, the Second Temple with uh, a group of Pharisees around maybe, yeah, let's let's go around like 300 to 200 BC ish. Um, that was not very popular. It was a minority view. Uh, so this is also to say that assuming that interpretation is correct, this literal eternalism of conscious torment. Um, that was a novel idea in, in Judaism that, assuming this is what Jesus taught, Jesus sort of brought to the fore, which is fair enough because he brought a lot of things to the fore in Judaism that weren't necessarily popular within its own system. Um, and then from Gehenna, we have Tartarus, which is, I think, once or twice in the New Testament. It's not in the Old Testament at all. It's, an old, it's a Greek word. It's the word that Plato uses when he's talking you know, certain parts about the thanogeography of hell, if you will. Um, and that's in Revelation. Um, that that's the part that uh, Gehenna gets thrown into at Last Judgment, where that was designed for the demons and um, the fallen angels. Um, and then we have Hades, which is a Greek word in the New Testament that just means death. Um, it could mean the state of being dead, the state of death, and it can mean the literal place of death and also the god of death, Hades. Uh, so you can use that in a lot of ways, like the devil, hell, 
um, soul sleep, whatever. Um, and when the Greek, the Eastern Church fathers are, are talking about how they're usually using this term of Hades um, and the torment of Hades, the torments of hell. So regarding the final judgment and the separation of the sheep and goats, before, I think we take a lot of presumption when we read these verses and just assume it's whatever tradition we're born into. Again, I think it's telling that most early Christians and some of the church fathers, although granted a minority, who themselves knew Hebrew and knew Greek and knew the culture in which the Old and New Testaments were written, um, themselves read these passages and did not get the internalist ideas that we have nowadays. So there's probably a lot of things being lost in culture and lost in translation and the, the degree to which there are contextual hints linguistically of what you take in a more immediate way or what you take metaphorically or hyper, hyper uh, ballistically. Right, I think our culture tends to read very hyperbolistically passages like a camel, you know, passing through the eye of a needle, uh, as far as rich people gaining salvation, and then we take very literal certain other passages. So again, it's I don't put much stock in sola scriptura here because it's always just a reflection of what's already in you. Um, you get out of the Bible what you want, basically, if you're just reading the Bible nakedly. Um, as for the separation of the sheep and the goats. You could see this in one sense of that every heart, I think this is what Suzitsen says, that the line of good and evil runs between the heart of every single man. There's a sheep and goat in all of us. Now, some of us get rid of that goat, the old man in the biblical language, uh, in this life through sanctification, but that's very, very few people. Those are basically the saints. Uh, the rest of us have to go through the next life to get rid of that goat, purgatory, Hades, whatever you call it. The final judgment is the final separation of that where there's no continual purgation. That is Jesus putting a stop to all of it and God becoming, as Paul says, all in all. Um, mystically, that could mean something like universalism. It also could mean something like eternal tor eternal conscious torment. But I think you could read it either way. I think that whether we read it one way or the other is, again, dependent on how we're already, what assumptions we're coming into this for Scripture. I mean, ultimately, I don't think this is a rational I don't think anything is, but especially not theology and especially not this topic within theology, soteriology or the theology of salvation. It's not a very rational thing you can just debate and argue about. Um, I think it's something intuitive and I think it's something mystically understood, which is why you have saints who had a mystical understanding of this on both sides of the aisle, right? Um, and I think for some people, universalism is probably true and for some people it's not, which doesn't make any sense logically or rationally. Um, but that's precisely because it is a mystical reality. Growing up uh, in a Protestant church, it was always kind of hell was if you died and didn't believe in God or hadn't repented in some churches, then you went to hell, eternal torture. Mm -hmm. When did that idea and premise start and gain popularity? So it's hard to know for sure. Again, we, we have Augustine and Chrysostom, who are both very much not universalist, saying in their writings or in their sermons that the majority of Christians at the time believed in universalism. Augustine calls them the, the pious but naive or something to that effect. Um, pious in the sense that they're taking God's mercy right, but they're not looking at God's sense of justice. Um, I imagine, like I was saying, like already the Jews had some Pharisees who took this interpretation, right, already before Christ. So it's always been there, you know, either in the pagan version or in the Jewish version. And I'm sure when some Jews became Christian, there was a minority of this Jewish sect, of this Pharisaical sect that took that belief with them. But they were probably the minority. I think what started to happen, you'll notice that the more educated, which is to say the church fathers, um, start to have a more punitive idea um, around the third and fourth centuries or they're just choosing to write about it more. I mean, the other thing to take in mind here is that even the church fathers who are universalists, they, those who choose to write about it at least, because we have ones like St. Macrina who didn't write anything, but on the account of other church fathers taught universalism, right? So there, there's another nuance here, which is that uh, the church fathers like Origen or like Gregory of Nice or Isaac the Syrian, they'll all say like, even if this is true, which is to say universalism, it's not something that should be talked about. So the church fathers who did write about it who were universalists were probably writing to a very small audience that they trusted. They weren't writing sermons about this in any case um, because it took out any zeal. Uh, secondarily, that leads to the other assumption here, which is that there were probably a lot of church fathers that held or at least were hopefully universalist, hopefully universalist, but never wrote about it. Or if they said anything, they said it in a very private conversation to someone who was struggling with despair. 
uh, because they did not want to uh, corrupt the flock with that sort of teaching. So that's another thing to keep in mind. But in either case, it seems, according to scholars like Romelli, it seems to have been the major- majority view of um, Christians in, in the early churches. I think there was a political reason, I mean, very obviously with um, Justinian in, the, in, the, fifth, in the, the Fifth Council, but there was, a, there was a political reason to accrue Christianity into a sort of megalo, me- megalithic, uh, monolithic structure. Um, that had a very intense authority to um, from the emperor himself to damn and damn, not just conditionally, but eternally, uh, to excommunicate, to anathematize. And if the stakes were much higher, they weren't merely temporal, but eternal, it gave the emperor a lot more explicit power. Um, so I am kind of with some of the Protestants here, probably not in the way they would want me to be or for the reasons they are, but in their general critique of what became of early Christianity is becoming imperialized, and therefore, some of that tradition, uh, I don't want to say totally corrupted, but being bent towards certain interpretations Polluted. over others. Sorry? Polluted. Yeah. Uh, in order to benefit a political regime. Um, I mean, I think that happens in the Old Testament too, so I don't think it's scandalous or alarming. But there you go. Um, I, think, I think that's... So basically what you have happen is that in the Fifth Council, um, it's debated over what exactly is meant by this, but we have a condemnation of originism. Um, people debate whether or not originism applies to origin himself, or the origin is condemned by name and asthmatized by name. And these condemnations were added on as an addendum to the council after it was ratified uh, by the emperor. Um, however, these, uh, these condemnations of originism and origin were later uh, repeated in later councils uh, that without ratification. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. Now, again, you can debate whether or not Origen's referring to Origen himself or the infallibility of councils or whatever, um, but there is definitely a strong cultural, political, and religious incentive for people who held to universalism after the Fifth Council to simply stop talking about it or to simply stop believing it. Now, I don't think it's a case closed, you know, sort of deal or silver bullet because we still have saints after the council who are canonized saints like Isaac the Syrian who are still teaching universalism. So if you're going to say, I, you know, you had a past before the fifth council, but you're suddenly a heretic after the fifth council, you have these problems like Isaac the Syrian, who's a saint in both the Catholic and Orthodox churches. Now, obviously, if you're Protestant, none of this really means anything. You have your Bible and you can just say, well, this is my interpretation and everyone else is wrong. So again, I, I don't really have any argument against Sola Scriptura. That kind of stands on its own. But at least if you're going to make a traditional argument either for or against universalism, it kind of concentrates around this area. And I think both sides tend to make mistakes in how much stock they put in this because it's not a very clear-cut issue. Um, so I guess this idea of this sudden, this sudden idea of hell, of hellfire, always there, right? Always That was eternal, you die, you go to hell, blah, blah, blah. Even that most people went to hell, the vast majority, including baptized Christians, went to hell. Um, has always been there, but it became very much popular in the West after Augustine. And it became popular with Augustine because he was very influenced by Tertullian. He's not a church father or a saint, but probably the most influential theologian in all of Western history. We typically accredit Augustine for this, but my, which is true, but my point is that Augustine is really just repeating a lot of what Tertullian said. Augustine is sort of the um, cleansed, politically, religiously correct palate uh, by which Tertullian becomes the god emperor of the West, or the god theologian of the West. Um, Nietzsche, in in one of his books, I think it was Genealogy of Morals, has this wonderful passage where he quotes in full Tertullian's sermon on the joys of the blessed as they witness those in hell, uh, which is later repeated by theologians like Lombard, uh, St. Aquinas, um, a lot of more Western Catholic thinkers. This is not something you see ever in the East, even among fathers who are teaching eternal torment. They're never teaching in the idea of something that is joyous or something that the blessed take pleasure in. Um, this is very explicit in Lombard. Aquinas, it's indirect, but it is, Aquinas is basically saying that the blessed take pleasure in the justice being executed on the damned. Um, and this is all coming out of Augustine through Tertullian. So Augustine popularizes this notion of Tertullian, um, of massa damnata, of infant, unbaptized infants being damned. Again, not saying that it didn't orig- it, it originated with Augustine or even Tertullian. It was always there, I think. I just think it became much more popular, especially in the West, because they didn't really have access to the Greek fathers. I mean, one way to read Vatican II is damage control for the fact that all these Latin theologians and philosophers were suddenly having access and 
paying serious attention to the church fathers, the Eastern church fathers. Um, so I don't know, I guess, does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's always been there. It just became much popular later on. And I, again, I think there was a lot of political, direct and indirect political incentive. I also see how eter- the idea of eternal hell, it's very interesting to me psychologically, because I think it, it's kind of like a, a meme in the traditional sense of that word that is self-replicating. Um, generally, more conservative um, patterns or more aggressive patterns or more punitive patterns gain more popularity in human sociology and human psychology um, in times of distress. So the more punitive or the more present that death is in a culture, the more that these conservative defense mechanisms will kick in. What is the most intense pun- what is the most intense punitively and so on and so on. And I think hell for most of history ended up gaining the eternal hell, I should say, ended up gaining the advantage because of that. Um, because it, it had this sense of vengeance and it had this sense of really sticking it to your enemy. Now, I'm not saying this was on any conscious level, although for some like Lombard it was or Aquinas. Um, but I think it was definitely there unconsciously in the back as this sort of self-replicating meme. And there's a sense you get this if you look closely at things like Pascal's wager, that um, assuming that one is agnostic in in this naked sense, uh, which I'm agnostic on this issue as well as pretty much any issue, um, it always becomes, in in interest of self-egoist perseverance, um, it always becomes advantageous to take the most conservative possible interpretation theologically, uh, which is to say, it's to your best interest to assume that the most amount of people are going to be damned and therefore to act in most accordance with that and and therefore interpret theology in the most conservative possible way. It's your safest route. Yes. So what do you you personally believe will happen to just the average Joe when they die? You know, they they go to church, they say they believe, but they have their doubts, they sin. What do you think happens to them? I, I don't know, but I guess I would say my intuition from what I've seen with a lot of religions is that there aren't really many passages into the next life that are not some ex- extreme form of torment that we can only begin to fathom in this life. This life, you know, even going from Socrates and Plato, is merely an education for the gymnasium that is that step into the next life. And it's not fun. There's basically no religion that says it's a, you know, a blessed entry, right? Um, this is very different than the sort of new age near death experiences you get in the past 50, 60 years. That is like this blessed being of light comes and assures me that all is connected, all is love, and we're all just going to die and become one with the universe. Again, these are kind of half truths, but I think it's very misleading. Um, even if death itself is not painful, the process of passing into that next world is. That makes me feel better. <laughs> that actually uh, led into a question I've been curious about recently which is this sort of new agey near death experiences cuz that like you said that's a pretty recent phenomenon that people have those sorts of experiences. Well, I wouldn't say having the experience but the interpretation of those experiences, the way they interpret it is. And you think that's pretty uh pretty much mediated by the current sort of cultural uh, assumptions people have? Or yeah, so my it's basically what I said in a previous podcast regarding the astral realm. When you're in the astral realm, when you're in the spirit realm, which I think a lot of these people legitimately are, um, what you're seeing is a Rorschach. Same thing with schizophrenics in waking life. What you're interacting with is something that's substantively there. But what it is showing you is playing off what it knows about you. And it's it's usually not a good spirit. It's usually trying something to deceive you. Again, this isn't even Christianity speaking. This is basically every religion when it comes to dealing with the spirit realm. It is a realm of deception. Yeah, you may get a good angel or you may get a good spirit or you may say Jesus, but that's very, very, very rare, right? You're Most of the time you're dealing with at best a neutral spirit who probably has something out for you, right? At worst, you have an evil spirit who wants to torture your soul and feed off of it energetically. So... It, I, I'm very much uh, someone who believes in your death experiences. I just don't believe whatever people are seeing are very accurate. And it's interesting that near death experiences are something that happened consistently throughout history. Obviously, they're much more well documented recently. Um, but I think what people tend to experience in near death experiences are very much conditioned um, by their culture and whatever it is these spirits are trying to play off our culture in some sort of back and forth game to get people to think certain certain things. For their own advantage, and one age, you know, that might be um, some sort of a Greek god or spirit or satyr, and this age it might be aliens. 
uh, Seraphim Rose has gone to lengths to point out the similarities between uh, the reports of alien abductions by total unbelievers and those of demonic possession. Or um, or even the, the multiverse, which seems right. to be more popular now. Yeah, the aliens. quantum coomer. <laughs> Do you quantum remember Kumerism. several years back, almost 10 years ago, uh, this, the book uh, Heaven and Back? Was that the name of that? Heaven is for, Heaven is for real. real. Do you remember that? Yeah, I have a copy of the, it somewhere. I haven't read it. Said he died yeah. and he saw all this stuff. Do you think that's complete BS? Or do you think that he did see that and it is that Warshock test, as you said? Or do you think that's Well, I think he saw fabricated? some. I don't know. I haven't read the book. Okay. I, I'm just going to be generous and assume what he saw was what he actually saw. Okay. But I'm just saying I'm generally quite skeptical of whatever Basically, it is. Basically, when reporting. he was in heaven, he saw, you know, everyone he knew, his whole family, and they, they had wings. They It was just kind of a happy time they had wings yeah they all flew around and well yeah i definitely cool. don't believe that <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I'm, I'm already skeptical of I, I think i think this is something that he might have had an experience but i think his family was a lot of people thought it was his dad was like a pastor of a dying church so a lot of people thought it was kind of a money grab by the dad yeah that makes me skeptical okay so yeah. you you wouldn't believe those tales of oh someone died they went to heaven and they saw their dead relatives and everyone they had was wings happy and there was no pain anymore yeah, that, I'm not buying it. <laughs> I mean, maybe he saw something real, but I think that sounds like something his family influenced him okay. to, to say after the experience. Okay. Makes a better the story than I saw Graham and she was suffering. Yeah. <laughs> she was being tormented. Well, I mean, you see those getting popular too. I mean, of this of the documented, the scientifically documented near death experiences, the bad ones of like, oh, I went to hell or whatever, or it was painful, tend to be rare. They tend to be a minority. Now, that being said, I don't think just because someone's having a bad experience that they're suddenly More safe. More believable. Of, right. Yeah, it's, yeah. Not, it's, not, it's not suddenly safe. The demons can use that in their own advantage as well. You know. You should have a near-death experience on the podcast. Yeah, okay, well, you know, bring it out. You know? <laughs> we had a doctor <laughs> in finally, training. So. Finally get the answer. <laughs> There's a really good horror film. It's very gory, but it's very good that it deals with this called Martyrs. It's a French horror film. And basically, it's it's torture porn, but it's good torture porn. And it's uh, this woman who gets kidnapped by a by a cult, and they induce the most possible pain on her while having a professional team of medical experts keep her alive, um, in order to have her witness the the real meaning of martyr, um, a vision. And she the cult is waiting for this vision at the end of the film. It's really good. It's a really good ending. Have you seen Human Centipede? Yeah, I actually think this is a really good film, but I don't know how much I want to talk about my justifications for why at the moment. <laughs> I love the whole series. I think each film gets better. I okay. think Human Sympathy 3 is actually Wait, the best. Wait, you think that it gets better? Yeah. I think it gets much better, yeah. Human Centipede 1 is like the appetizer. Um, I couldn't make it through all of 2. When they showed the guy two is masturbating really good. with sandpaper. Yeah. Well, it's like, it's like, it's like good in the to... way that Salo or Desaad or... You know, it's like if, if you really want to deal with nihilism, you have to. I appreciate films that do that honestly. I don't like these half ass films, like speaking of quantum coomerism, everything, everywhere, all at once, that sort of do this half ass, like a Rick and Morty, you know, oh, here's nihilism. Let's just kind of be this passive, absurdist, optimistic so nihilism. No, I want, I want nihilism full frontal, right? And, I, and Human Centipede does that. That's beautiful. <laughs> Just like why I like brutalism is the most out of any modern architecture. Next podcast, hauntology of the torture pornographic <laughs> image. I would rather have 10 Boston City Halls than one more strip mall on <laughs> Yes, road. yes, exactly. So where do you want to go from here? Do you want to dive more into... Another question I had a little bit was how the um, the door-to-door pastor fire hell and brimstone how that influenced america's perception in the 50s and if that's something that we're still struggling to overcome or if you think that was kind of just a point in time that we've moved past i mean that goes all the way into america's great awakening um and you, you can you can pull that again that s- sense uh the very immediate sense of eternal dread out of catholic roots it's a very catholic thing a very modern example of that is james joyce's um it's the one where there's a sermon that a, a Catholic priest is giving him. Um, and it goes into a lot of detail on the specific sufferings of eternal damnation. Is it? I, w- I want to say, but I wasn't sure. It's definitely one of his more easier to read novels. So probably, yeah. Um, 
Which one? I don't know. If I guess Portrait that. of the Artist as a Young Man. It, the, oh. It's a young boy. There's a really good film uh, that has a scene depicting this this scene. I think you can find it on YouTube um, where a Catholic priest is giving a sermon on the, the torments of hell. I mean, look at um, St. Leonard of Port Maurice. He's a Catholic saint who talks about the vast fewness of the saved. I mean, this is why I think as a Catholic, if you're really going to follow Catholic theology consistently, you basically end up a Jansenist, which is basically a Calvinist um, Catholic. Um, this is another thing I want to talk about with moral intuition, actually, um, because I think this is an argument on both sides of the aisle with universalism, um, which is basically, I think both are misguided. And I, it, this relates to the podcast we did on Beyond Good and Evil as well, um, which is basically that... Um, Either God demands eternal torment or God will not eternally torment because of my sense of morality, right? And um, the Calvinist, one thing I like about universalism just as a intellectual ploy is that it really brings out the worst in people um, on both sides. And what I mean is like, I noticed a lot of Orthodox and Catholics arguing against David Bentley Hart suddenly became very Calvinist. And what I mean is that Typically, if you argue with Calvinists, you would you you would give this moral argument, um, which is that we cannot say uh, that uh, God would do uh, damn people double predestination um, from the beginning without their free will, uh, because uh, that would be evil. And, and he's a, a loving God, right? And a Calvinist can just immediately, obviously, counter that we have no right as finite beings to judge an infinite being. Uh, we have no right about to say what love is. We have no right to say what good or evil is, which on surface is a totally legitimate argument. I think what's interesting is that a lot of people arguing against universalists who would say they're not Calvinist are making the same argument. A lot of universalists might, might say, we know it by the nature of God. Actually, this is St. Isaac the Syrian, the universalist church father, literally makes this argument. He says it is not the nature of our creator to create people for knowing they will be eternally damned. Some of the Orthodox I've gotten into the most uh, in-depth uh, conversation of regarding this topic, who are not universalists, usually end up coming to this problem. And what I notice is they end up in a pseudo-open theism. They want to say that, uh, they want to agree with St. Gregory Nyssa, or sorry, uh, St. Isaac the Syrian is what I meant to say, that uh, God w God's nature would not allow him to create a being for knowing he will be damned, regardless of the question of free will. Therefore, God only knows, this is what they'll say, God only f knows the creature's will in so far it is real, which is to say in so far it's created. And since God hasn't yet created it, he doesn't know its outcome until he creates it. I think this is a total bullshit, but... You know, like he creates and he goes, oops. Yeah, right, yeah. exactly, right. Like So basically, instead of a uh, ty tyrannical, punitive God, we have a God that's rolling dice, which I think is even worse. Yeah, it's like a careless <laughs> God. I, I think this is actually... I, I prefer Calvin's God over the gambling God, right? Um, I, I don't think you end up with any satisfying answer here. I think you just have to bite the bullet and become a Calvinist. What about what about the argument since he's, uh, you know, forever, he's existed for all of time and all of the future, he automatically just knows. He's not making you have that, that um, outcome, but he knows since he's in the future as well. The, the problem is that if he knows that that's going to be the outcome before he makes you, you know, why would he follow through with making you? Right, and then and then the Calvinist answer is that God creates the damned uh, to glorify His nature, which I think is the only intellectually honest answer. So it comes back to your quote from last year, where you said Calvinism might be true and it would just suck. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> I, we that's my point, though. We could totally live in a world where God not only damns people, He damns everyone, like everyone, like no one is saved, right? And we would have no right to question that God. Now, this is where I think there's a essential intuitive division going on existentially, which is that, yeah, sure, this God can exist, but what is Christianity actually saying? What is, what is revolutionary about Christianity? That Calvinism totally castrates from Christianity. And this is the point a lot of the Eastern Church fathers, especially uh, Gregory Nisa will make, which I talked about previously, is that there is an intuitive connection between our soul and what is virtuous, and what is virtuous for God. This is the main critique Plato has of the pagans, of Homer, right? That there's like no moral intuition between what the gods do and what man does. This is why Homer has to be abolished in Plato's society. And what Christianity is saying is that God manifests himself to give man a moral guide, not merely as a moral system for man, but as a system of virtue that makes him into God, makes him like God right? What was supposed to be accomplished in the Garden of Eden, but couldn't, which means that there's something about our soul, about our heart that actually aligns with God's sense of virtue. 
This is exactly why you have the Beatitudes, you know, to be merciful and so on, because that's what makes you like God. Well, then what is God like? That's what we see in Christ. We know the 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 some of the church fathers say like they would find prayers in the early church uh, after Christ that were addressing only the Father, and they were burned not because they were heretical, but because we only know Christ or we only know God the Father through God the Son. So that's what's so revolutionary about Christianity. If this is exactly the point that Christianity is standing on, and I think it is, then we have to say there's a moral intuition. I don't really like the word moral, right? But let's say an intuition of virtue or how to existential intuition about what it means to be a human and what that means our actions should be and how that connects to God himself. And this is what Paul is getting at when he says that the law of God is written upon all the hearts of man. It doesn't matter if you're Christian or pagan or atheist or whatever. Everyone is worshiping God. I don't really believe in atheist, but we have very distorted ways of how we go about that. In either case, we have the law that we're either abiding by or not abiding by. And if you choose to not abide by it in this life, you're going to have to burn with that in the next one. Right? So, so you're basically saying that if you are a Christian, you have to believe pretty much that God is loving in our way. That the argument that now, we can't judge how he with is qualifications. Good. Okay, because <laughs> I'm saying that that gets into the whole problem of evil type thing. Well, yeah, and this is why I said the problem of evil is really a non-problem because good and evil are human constructs, it, right? There's a lot of nuance and subtlety here that's difficult to discuss because we're so used to it with our language. Okay. Um, I guess I guess what I'm saying because because you also can't run too far with this whole idea of moral intuition because everyone has a different idea of what goodness is or what love is. Love is love. Blah 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 blah. You know, you can run this anywhere. It becomes total moral relativism. Okay, so that's not what I'm saying. Um, there is an intuition that is both proto-rational, ultra-rational, trans-rational, and also inclusive to rationality, right? We're all right. inclusive. We're very progressive. It's inclusive to rationality, um, but it's also beyond rationality and before rationality, very much like Plato's Eros. It is the beginning and end of philosophy. Reason is just a medium that gets you back and forth. It is not the beginning or end. That was the big mistake of the West. We kind of put reason at the center at the beginning and end of everything. And Freud comes in and totally decimates that. We are actually very irrational creatures, right? That's why I always thought it was weird that people say Freud's an enlightenment thinker, even though he would probably think of himself that way. He's very much not. But in, in either case, um, this is to say that there are... I mean, this is why I think if you're going to do this, and every religion has acknowledged this, is that there are people who have had genuine epistemological connections to the divine saints, church fathers, whatever. Um, no matter what holy scripture or book you have, you can't found a religion off this. This is what Sarah from Rose's teacher, who was a Taoist uh, sage from China, said to Rose. He said, you're going to be the last person, not just in the West, but in, in the East, of anyone uh, who even knows what Taoism is. And Rose says, but you have Taoist texts in China. He's like, yeah, but communism destroyed China, or destroyed Taoism. It doesn't matter if someone picks up a book on Taoism or the Tao Te Ching and reads it. They can't just be Taoist. You need a liturgical oral tradition that is passed down. It's the same reason I don't think Protestantism works. You have to have an actual existential lived communion that is passed down, right? Um, and Orthodoxy and, and Sufism are really the only religions left doing that at all. But in either case, you know, so credit to Simeon, <laughs> but, you know, our, our Muslim universalist friend who's a Sufi. But, uh, well, you know, okay, anyway. <laughs> you need to repeat that line to him. Yeah, because yeah. He, we'll, we'll make subtle distinctions about whether or not Sufi is a subcategory. of. Oh, yeah, he will not. Right, like I know, I know, I know, yeah, I know where he's yeah, going to go with that. But yeah. I'm saying to an American audience here, you know, he probably don't even know what Sufi is. So, you know, give me give me some allowances. <laughs> um, where, where were we? Well, it was kind of coming off of um, we do have some ability to mm -hmm. understand God, right, understand right. God so and morality. Basically, yeah. this, this, this perennial understanding that the traditions of the fathers or the ancestors is something you align yourself to existentially in liturgical practice and that by then you acquire discernment to determine whatever is holy text or whatever you're reading. Um, and even then, you're going to have a lot of people disagreeing with each other, including these church fathers, right? I mean, we have church fathers who were contemporary with each other that were at each other's necks and are both now saints, right? And never really had any moment where they came together agreeing with each other. I mean, even to this day in Russia, it's still very debated among the, the line of saints to what degree monasteries should own land or not. It was never something really resolved. I think the topic of salvation regarding uh, universalism is much like this. It's not a settled debate as much as people on both sides probably want to make it so.
But uh, the, 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 the deeper question here is like, do we have any moral intuition whatsoever with the divine? And if so, what is it and how is it accessed? That's really the question at the heart at, at issue here. It's not an easy one. I think the West is already on the wrong foot because it assumes that that's determined somewhere in the reason and rationality or sola scriptura, which is just another way of saying it's my reason judging the Bible, right? Cool. Sounds good to me. There aren't any questions. Yeah, I, I don't. I, I I don't have a lot to to ask on this one. But I think you and I have had this conversation like five times already. Mm -hmm. So, where does uh, Seraphim Scapular come into this? Yeah, where does Seraphim? You know, well, actually, I want to say a I, scapular I, I actually, for the audience. Well, I actually did want to say real quick. I, I, uh, Garrison, I, I, I saw that you had messaged me. It was like last week, and I'm like, oh, he wanted information on scapulars. It's scapular pilled, I think you said, and. <laughs> And and I do want you to become scapular pilled, um, but grandma, I it worked. Grandma's thing worked. But I what's this? Our our grandma. We we realized that whenever we go stay at our grandparents, they're very Catholic. Uh -huh. um, we always find these weird things in the sheets. And <laughs> after you did that TikTok about scapulars, mm -hmm. we realized that she was putting scapulars in our bedding. Yeah. And that's, now Garrison here is he's asking you for scapulars. So I guess I, it, 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 it does it, work like that. I actually heard of one. Um, It was uh, like a fashion designer or something who would actually sew them inside clothes. Um, it's witchcraft. I, it <laughs> in is, the good sense. In the good sense. <laughs> I, I realized, you know, you sent me that message. <laughs> it doesn't yeah. have to. <laughs> All religion is not yeah, consensual. Yeah, yeah, you, you're, past, you're past consent. Um, <laughs> Rape by the scapular, that's the title. Um, no, I, 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 I was going to respond to that, and I'm sorry I didn't, but I realized that, that I didn't really have any like literature or anything that would be worthwhile. My experience of, of scapular, sorry, Corey, I've hijacked your podcast um, about universalism to talk about scapulars, but um, was just very much lived in the Catholic Church. I, I knew um, a Carmelite, um, who used them. I had read a book as a kid um, and, and it's not, you know, it was meant for, I think it was meant for, you know, a young audience, uh, but it was just a collection of stories of, of um, scapulars saving people in a storm at sea, or there's one that stuck with me. There was like wildfires that burned down like a whole neighborhood. And there was one house that didn't burn down. And it was this house that had a scapular on the door, many stories like this. Then my Orthodox godfather wasn't a uh, former Catholic he really like he always was wearing a scapular he was always giving scapulars to me and his other godchildren and so it was just a series of sort of an experience of of hearing stories of how this was how it worked um i don't buy into it to the degree in which and this is i think Corey's you know big kind of beef with it i i believe is is that you know whoever wears a scapular shall not you know experience eternal you know fire I, I think that's a little, you know, that's a little leaving something like that up to chance. You know, it's kind of like the Orthodox. If you die on Good Friday, you go immediately to heaven, um, which is in some like old country Greeks, I think Greece particularly. Uh, that I, I'm I'm skeptical of. But the experiences of, of having grown up and hearing these stories of of these working to help and save people um, from disaster uh, was enough to convince me to wear one and try to encourage others. Yeah, so that, that's more, more empirically based. Th that's, right. that's my issue is right. that it, taken to its extent, it's it's too much moral luck. It's any moral luck at all is, right. is problematic. What I mean by moral luck is basically the idea that salvation in some way comes down to just being lucky. And a very direct example of this is that if we say that people praying for you at death uh, is more likely to grant you salvation than a neutrally good prince who would be damned eternally uh, is very popular and famous, so a lot of people pray for him. Is much better off than a pretty good homeless person who dies uh, unanimously, but he had one sin that damns him for eternity. The uh, neutral uh, uh, prince is the one who goes to heaven, and this decent homeless guy goes to hell for eternity, right? That would be a very neat example. Basically, your salvation, regardless of however what you do uh, in your own free will, is basically going to be determined by moral luck. Um, and I think there's a lot of things in Christianity that point towards this. I think the only solution to get out of it is universalism. Um, but in either case, you end up with this very Calvinist view that uh, regardless of free will's existence, um, some of this comes down to just being in the right place at the right time, either in this life or the next. And with the scapular, it, it's like either like, like let's say someone's wearing it, then he, he you know, um, 
some someone steals it from him and then he dies the next day and he goes to hell versus someone who was wearing it and he didn't get something stolen from him because he lives in a very rich, nice neighborhood where people generally don't steal from him and he dies the next day and he goes to heaven because of the scapular, right? It's totally unrelated to any virtual moral. And in fact, it goes against Jesus' teaching that the poor are the ones who are blessed, um, not the people who can afford all these nice trinkets and whatever um, or, or pay for alms to get out of purgatory or pay for alms to have people pray for them, right? Um, but... Uh, it makes me feel uncomfortable and icky. It does. It just. It's very Calvinist to me. It's 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 a uh, crypto Calvinist. It to me, I, and I understand that. I mean, I, I would again. I, I don't really take it to the extent that that some do. That it's uh, but get, if get, you're get going with the most card. conservative reading or wear all the scapulars, should all wear them. <laughs> right. Yes. I I view it more as a as a sort of a totem. You know. That sure. Yeah. Of, I'm not all down for that. Yeah. I just don't like. The only people who are going to wear scapulars, at least as with Catholics, are generally going to be pretty traditional Catholics. And I think it just, it's so in your face about moral luck um, in a very disturbing way. I'm like, just be a Calvinist at this point. You know, just roll the dice, basically. Just wear the scapular. Mm -hmm. I've been trying to convince Corey to wear a scapular. I used to wear a scapular all the time when I was Catholic. I told you that's what made me orthodox. Yeah, yeah, it kind of backfired, backfired there. Yeah. All right. Well, I think we've reached the end. I, I will say quickly. Like, <laughs> well, like no, Calvin. never mind. <laughs> in so far as a totem, you could wear, you know, a D and D die around your neck and assign certain values to it that are going to have the same effect. Yeah, but this was given from the Theotokos. The Theotokos that the also Theotokos said if you don't D &D. wear this when you die, you'll be eternally damned. So mm, I'm, I, I don't know how much I really buy into this part of it. You know. Screw you, Corey. <laughs> All right. We reached the end of the 50-minute hour. We still any, have four minutes. Any closing remarks? Yeah, we, got, we got four minutes. You're trying to chip our oh, audience out for four minutes here. Oh, okay, <laughs> final remarks, four minutes. <laughs> My patients would get mad at me if I chipped them out of four yeah. minutes. <laughs> um, well, I, don't, I don't know. <laughs> closing remarks <laughs> are the scapular. <laughs> Are there, are there other questions? I thought there would be a lot more debate here or questions. We, we needed like Jacob or that, Jonathan that's, on. That's why, and you got pissy with me, I, I wanted to wait until like Jonathan got on or something. But this, this was just an intro yeah. to Universal. Well, there are, are there introductory sort of questions I didn't... To end the introductory questions to end the podcast with? You, no, like, you know what I mean? Like the sort of questions <laughs> someone being introduced to this topic would ask... That I okay, have okay. How how can like a small baby or a young kid get cancer and die? That yeah, well, well, yeah. <laughs> well that's, that's that's something you hear all the time. If like if the problem of evil, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the good closing question <laughs> explain the problem of evil. Yeah. <laughs> we got four minutes. I mean, there are like a million ways you can answer this question. I think I think it's going to be different. For Jared, did you have one? Let, let's be like more, I guess, on universalism. I mean, I think it's yeah. Well, I was I was just going to say I don't really have any questions. <laughs> like the the entire most of the arguments you hear against um, you know universalism come from very particular readings of like the the sheep and the goats and mm -hmm. other passages like that, and you you really address that at length. Um, yeah. Oh, sorry. No, no, you're good. You're good. I, I actually did want to say, I mean, I think the the I think the problem a lot of people have with universalism and it's something that, you know, I will say bothers me too, is you do read things like sheep and goats, and it does seem to be very clear. And but, but you also read things like every knee will bow, God will be all in all. So it's like, how do you read those in that context and then suddenly read that in this context? Sure. And it's because we come to the Bible with certain cultural predispositions, both consciously and unconsciously, already ingrained to how we're going to interpret the text. And when you have most early Christians who knew the languages the Bible was written in, not taking this view, who very confidently felt about universalism, we have to ask ourselves to what degree is whatever we interpret within the Bible coming out of these predispositions. Sure. Um, uh, but your your interpretation I thought was interesting. Um, and maybe you can close off with, with just going back to that a little bit. Um, that the sheep and the goat is like within each person. It, it reminds me of that meme, inside you are two wolves. Yeah. You know, it's like inside you is a sheep and a goat. Um, but like, so it's sort of, can, can you kind of maybe go into that? Like, what does it mean to have like the sheep and the goat inside you? Is it sort of it's like the, the shadow self? I and mean, the, Jesus talks about this like almost every other sermon he's giving. But I'm saying within the, yeah, I know, but in within the individual, I mean, it's almost like the shadow self and, yeah, sure. you know, the, the, okay, I was trying to get you yeah. to like, I mean, talk about it. But. The, the other thing, the thing here is like, you know, it's going to be painful to have that part of you ripped out, right? right? It's purification is painful. It's a, it's a fire that consumes. 
Um, and if you've spent most of your life building up that shadow, you know, whatever's left at you, when you get when you finally get to that final judgment, it's gonna be very little. You're not, you know, sure, yeah, okay, let's say with universalism, optimistically you're saved or whatever. But what does that salvation really even look like? If what's it's kind of like the opposite of what C.S. Lewis does. I don't really like this. I think it's another cop out. But he said it himself, like if he could change one thing about Christianity, it'd be eternal torment. And I think what he says in um, one of, one of his books, dealing specifically with this problem, it's that um, it's not so much the person. Uh, this is actually what David Bradshaw will take as well. The, the position he'll take. It's it's a philosophical pea zombie escape with of uh, t- eternal conscious torment is what I call it, where you get to have your cake and eat it too. It, basically, you um you have people. So C.S. Lewis says it's it's not the woman nagging who yeah. goes to hell. Yeah, it's just the nagging going on forever and ever. So basically, it's like she's still there, but she's not exactly conscious. He's like a pea zombie, and if the blessed looked down, they would see a woman in agony. But it's not actually the woman; it's just her nagging that's going on. Right. It's it's the most British argument ever. Yeah, it's, it's and yeah. <laughs> and it's like I always found that weird. And it's like okay, so you're basically annihilationist, but right. with the face right. of a. E- eternal it is annihilating yeah. I, I always str- I, I, with that particular example I always I always struggle with that because it's like well then what happened to the other part you know what, what I was saying with the sheep and goats it's interesting because it's like it's, your, your, your argument sort of like there's like two actual like forces almost within you like a force of the old man and the new man but yeah and the new man is what the man we are in Adam redeemed in Eden but that doesn't happen so we have to go through all these other bullshit bureaucracy red tape things to get back there and when we're baptized you know whether in this life or the next the fires of hades or the water here we have all that old man we have to clean out the old man isn't us the old man is the illusion the old man is what satan wants us to think we are but in and the new man isn't us either right the saints are nothing the saints are annihilated in god we are annihilated in god and what we think we are the old man is also an illusion but and not or not also an illusion is an illusion the new man that comes to take place of the old man is dying so that Christ, the Logos, the very structure of reality itself and beyond reality, becomes who we are. And that part that is, is, that is being destroyed and burned by Christ being superimposed onto us is the false self, is the ego, is the idea of self at all, the idea of any individual sense. Uh, that is the goat that is being eradicated in the fires of Gehenna. I, this, that's actually a perfect closer because i think it's going to give us a taste of the next podcast if we can ever get Simeon's little french ass in here to talk with us which hopefully will be this weekend um to talk about that aspect of the ego the ego death the very kind of you know boot we, we associate with like buddhism right you know the killing of the ego the way that that exactly like you said the way that manifests within mystic christianity the way it also manifests in islam Simeon will go on a lot about this i really hope that uh, if we can get him in here this weekend um, we can we can talk about that more in depth, along with uh, more about universalism. All right. Well, we've reached the end of the fifteen minute hour. Any closing remarks? Starve your goat. Bye. <laughs> Goodbye. We'll see you next time. <laughs>